work in here and to get to my office at FNU, Fiji National University, I used to have to walk all the way around here, nearly a kilometre. Um, and at the time I was walking with a stick and had a very severe OA in my knee, and I have a bionic knee so I can jump around, which is why I like to walk and talk. Um, and uh, that used to be quite challenging. So most of the hospital is like this. Now I want you to look really closely, okay? So there's lino coming off the floors, the wooden drawers have kind of been painted and repainted and repainted. Um, Notice this oxygen bottle here. I'll give you 90% guarantee that that oxygen bottle is empty. Um, the limiting factor in transferring a patient from the ward to the ICU was finding an oxygen bottle to put them on oxygen for the trip round to ICU. And I waited once 20 minutes after a cardiac arrest for them to find oxygen and it ran out on the way. Um, you'll notice uh, you know, the very kind of old painted over trolleys, louver windows, no air con. Um, these ceiling tiles are about to fall in and I'm pretty sure there's lots of asbestos everywhere. Um, that's the acute surgical and medical wards. And interestingly, so you can see how close the patients are. So patient here, patient here. Um, not enough room for a NATO stretcher in between. This is, was one of my favourite activities, teaching, teaching the um, local anaesthesia trainees. So there's a, to learn about ICU, ICU is part of anaesthesia, it is all over the Pacific in the same way that it used to be in Australia many, many, many years ago. And so all of the anaesthesia trainees when are expected to cover the ICU wherever they um, go. And so I was um, working in the ICU and teaching them about ICU stuff when they weren't in the operating theatre. This is a teaching ward round. So they were preparing for their master's exams. So the Masters of Anesthesia is an MMed MM program through Fiji National University. And it's a four year program. They do exams at the end of the third year. And they also run a diploma program um, in anaesthesia, which is a one-year program. And I'll talk about Samara in a minute where that's all they get. Um, but this group, uh, um, these are all Fijian students, but I'll show you a picture in a while where, which shows the students we had from all over the Pacific. So we take them on this medical case, okay? And Lisa says to Sova, um, Sova's now working in Geelong ICU, getting some upskilling. So if anyone works in Geelong, you'll see her there. Um, she takes the history in Fijian, because she's one of the best Fijian speakers in the, in the group of students. So I don't hear what the history, but she's asking him all the questions and I'm standing there looking around, taking a few photos. And then she presents to the group and everyone lines up to have a listen to his chest. And when you look around, there's this bucket next to the bed, which is full of blood. And, um, and we go off and we put up his chest x-ray and I'm just like standing at the back of the crowd, working out. I said, Lisa, looks like this guy's got TB. And she said, yeah. <laughs> Yep, so this guy's got active TB. He's sitting in the middle of the medical ward, coughing his guts up into the bucket next to the bed. And uh, that therein lies what a lot of the challenges are. All right, there's no space. There's no way you can do isolation infection control. None of the sinks worked in the wards. There was no soap for your hands and hand rub is non-existent. So I have been known to go to an arrest on the ward with my team and walk back to the ICU like this to find a sink to wash my hands with. We did manage during my time there to get 
the sinks fixed um, and the soap to be supplied, but they locked it up because people nicked it. So it really wasn't um, very beneficial. And then you walk down the corridor. So I walk literally around a corridor and down this corridor into this place, which is their ICU. Newly developed September 2015. Two um, pods, one of seven beds, one of eight beds. Looks shiny. Looks just like a bought one, doesn't it? Could be anywhere in Australia. Um, I don't think you can see here, but there's beautiful Hamilton ventilators, mind ray pumps. Mind ray don't work. Um, <laughs> uh, a dialysis machine. Yay! That's the only dialysis machine in the public system in Fiji at that time. And there are no renal replacement CVVH machines. That's it. This machine. And it came online when I was there. This man here, who now I think works in Queensland somewhere, I keep writing references for him. Uh, Ran, he was the dialysis nurse as well as the ICU nurse. And what we did um, was the government agreed to pay for 10 dialysis sessions for patients with acute kidney injury, with n we, which we felt was reversible with no chronic kidney disease. If you have chronic kidney disease in Fiji, it is a life sen sentence unless you can pay $250 a session. It's Australian dollars. So not many people can afford that. So if you get acute renal failure in this country that has a scourge of diabetes, if you get chronic kidney disease and chronic renal failure, you die. So if you come into the ICU though and you've got acute kidney injury on top of everything else because you present late with your sepsis and your diabetes and you're young, you get 10 sessions for your kidneys to get better. And if you're on 50 mics of adrenaline, I would have said in the old days, the old me, 2015, there's no way you can put a patient who's unstable on lots of inotropes on a dialysis machine. Just won't happen. They'll just bottom out and die. You can do it. <laughs> So what the Fijians taught me a lot was you can do it. And in fact, a lot of the boxes that we place around ourselves, the limits of what we can do, the limits of what we can provide, are imaginary. And with the swipe of a hand, you can just say, OK, let's do it. And it worked a few times. <laughs> But mostly we got young patients with diabetics, sepsis, end stage um, kind of organ failure late in their, you know, in their disease process and, and they died. But we did save a few people. Um, and now I understand there are two machines in CWM, ICU, and there's one in Latoka. So there are three in the country. Um, but unfortunately, as soon as somebody gets very skilled, um, they're attracted to come to a place where it's not quite as hard. So um, what Vichelle used to do was a full ICU shift because there's very, very, very few ICU trained nurses um, and most of the unit is staffed with interns, nursing interns who've never seen an ICU or ventilator or a sick patient in their life. And they come in and they look after these patients. So I did more CPR in CWM than I've done in my whole career. Because when the pump beeped, because you didn't have art lines, you had a random number generator on their arm, I had to stop saying that because it was all that was there. So I had to kind of be a believer in the random number generator. <laughs> but uh, the random number generator uh, would go up every three or five minutes, depending on how the nurses set it. 
And if the adrenaline infusion was running low and started beeping, they'd just pause it and walk off to make a new one. <laughs> <laughs> and then the patient would be in cardiac arrest and we'd be doing CPR. And it took a little while for me to join all those dots together because it wasn't entirely clear why we had so many cardiac arrests in the ICU. Um, and when we joined all those dots together, we actually discovered that there was some, a cupboard with some art line stuff in it to go with these new fancy monitors they got. But no one had bothered to teach them how to do it. So we did that for the very, very sick patients on lots of adrenaline. And we actually observed one morning on the ward round this whole phenomena of the adrenaline beeping, the nurse pausing it while we're doing our ward round and teaching, and the blood pressure on the outline just going, and I went, turn it back on. And we avoided the arrest, but everyone then kind of realised what was going on and a bit more vigilance occurred. So a lot of the stuff that we can teach, it's about, it's about stuff that we're aware of that they're not aware of, that they've not, not been taught, they've not been exposed to. But as soon as you give them an idea, they kind of run with it. We proned a patient um, in severe respiratory distress. That doesn't cost anything. You can do that anywhere, you know. Um, but they've never actually been taught. So we proned a patient. Man, the nursing staff were so happy about, because the oxygen came up and everything worked, about this simple thing that they could do that could make a difference. And then during Cyclone Winston, we had a Kiwi nurse, Kiwi ICU nurse come over and I taught them the doctor's way of proning. And she, she watched what I was doing and she said, can I teach them a different way? And I went, sure. And she fixed all the problems <laughs> that I'd created with my doctor's technique. But it was <clears throat> singularly amazing for me to teach the nursing staff. So, um, they were the most starved of input, education and recognition for what they were doing. Um, and so I managed, I got the OSMAT team, we'll talk a bit about OSMAT later, I got the OSMAT team during Cyclone Winston to stick in their bags um, some pilfered perk tracky kits, all the stuff that I needed um, to do perk trackies. Now I knew this wasn't going to be a technique that they were going to do long term. But we had a couple of patients we needed to move on and we had cyclone patients coming in and the ENT surgeon was out of town and we just needed, you know, a stopgap measure. But what it did was teach them a whole lot about um, airway access for difficult airways, etc. And so each, um, each one we put in a different registrar had scrub for it and put their hands on it and I'd teach them how to do it. And so we created this little tracky club. And so on the Viber network, it was, you know, so-and-so's joined the tracky club and, you know, this kind of group of, and they're so enthusiastic. So here, here you can see the multidisciplinary group, that the multinational group that we had. So Ming is from Tim, Ming and Colm, um, married couple from Timor-Leste that I still, um, have contact with and we're supporting. Um, Ty's from the Cook Islands. He's the only anaesthetist in the Cook Islands. Cook Islands is a bit boring. I think he's moving, moving back and forward to New Zealand. Um, Hilda here is from Kiribati um, and she's returned to Kiribati. Um, and uh, Fijian, Fijian, Fijian. Um, and we had um, a registrar from Samoa, and, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about Samoa in a while. So the challenges um, in these settings, when you go into it, one of the biggest challenges is to step completely out of your own paradigm of being able to put your hands on everything you need um, and have everything done for you. So you kind of have to be up for it. You also have to be up for young people dying of diseases that they wouldn't die of if you were at home. Um, and that's something to get your head around. And after a year of seeing lots of young people die from um, 
uh, leptospirosis and other infectious diseases that shouldn't occur because they're spread by rats in poor um, circumstances. You, you do, it does wear you down a bit and the people that work in these areas for many years, my hat's off to them. I'd go back in a heartbeat though. Um, so, you know, one day I came to work and they said, um, they've told us the normal saline's out of stock. Normal saline for the country is out of stock. Never had noradrenaline, except for some that we pilfered, <laughs> made us put in a suitcase in a back pocket. Um, one, day, one day I came to work and they said, oh, we, they think they're going to run out of adrenaline, which caused us to run around to all the wards in the operating theatre, etc., and gather all the adrenaline we could possibly find and put it in a drawer somewhere, just in case it was true. Um, we did run out, regularly run out of antibiotics, um, basic antibiotics, and it was very difficult to put your hands on expensive antibiotics and we had a multi-resistant Acinetobacter outbreak in both the paediatric hospital and the adult hospital during my time there. Our, ga <laughs> our blood gas machine broke. Our biochemistry machine broke at Chinese New Year, I remember this because they said the technician couldn't come from China to fix it because it was Chinese New Year. So I think that's around February. It was before the cyclone. And it did not get fixed until about May. Um, so we had no potassium in a population that come in with renal failure. Guess the potassium. And Vishal would say to me, what potassium bath are we going to run on the dialysis? Mm. Uh, none, no, I don't know, let me look at the ECG, really old fashioned, you know, let me have a look at the patient, let me have a guess. Um, the staff to patient ratios and the, and the working hours were terrible. From an ICU perspective, um, the fact that there's just one person who's training all these people in ICU, one CICM training um, specialist, makes it really difficult to deliver training, provide a service advocacy role and to improve the service. And there's great willingness to improve the service but there's not a lot of resources behind that. Um, and at the moment uh, there is pressure in the anaesthesia program to reduce the amount of time the trainees spend in ICU because the anaesthetists feel they're not getting enough anaesthesia time. And that, you know, it's kind of true, but you need to offer something for them to train in ICU. Um, and the community expectations with the internet and access to, re to international resources means that the community have expectations that far exceed what the country can provide. Um, and managing that at an ICU level is quite difficult. So when I returned from Fiji, I um, didn't go back into my director of ICU job. I went into the job as medical director of the NCCTRC. And so as part of that, um, I get to go to uh, the region and teach disaster preparedness. And what that gives me is an opportunity to provide intensive care support to other countries. And so our regional engagement program involves MIMS training, HMIMS training, trauma training, mentoring and other things. <coughs> so I've got an ED trainee from Timor that we're sponsoring to work in Darwin for a year and I've got an anaesthesia and ICU trainee from Fiji that we're sponsoring to work in Australia in Darwin for a year and we go out and we do work in this region. So I'll talk a little bit about Samoa uh, and I just might indulge you for a bit <laughs> um, because this is really important. So. The Samoan Health Minister has actually written to the college and asked us to help. And Samoa is uh, about 200,000 people. There's one ICU at the major hospital, TTTM in Apia. And that is run by Dina, a completely amazing doctor, um, who, uh, this is, sorry, this is Dina here, 
who did one year of anaesthesia and ICU in CWM and then went back to run the ICU, the new ICU. Um, Dr David Gallo went there for um, more than a year, I think, from New Zealand and helped to set it up. And now we provide, a group of us provide support for it through a Viber chat group where they post cases and we give advice. They desperately need more training. And so the college is about to embark on creating a Pacific Diploma of Intensive Care. And we're going to set up a training program. And what we will need when we set up that training program is lots of people to put their hands up to help teach it. And we can set up a training program for the doctors, but we may also need to set up a training program for the nurses, because there is no postgraduate ICU training for nurses in any of the Pacific. So the trauma centre, which I'll talk a little bit about later, is setting, is trying to encourage Fiji National Universities to set up um, an ED postgraduate nursing program in emergency medicine, because that's the easiest kind of route to get in. But from an ICU perspective, there is a lot of work to do. And I can tell you that the nurses um, are amazing. And because I just spent a small amount of time with this amazing group of women, mostly women, a couple of blokes, mostly women, um, one of the most touching things at the end of my 12 months was not really the farewells from the doctors, which was kind of expected, but the nurses asked me very shyly, could I please come to the ICU? at two o'clock on the second last day, if I had time. And I went into the tea room and they'd made me a beautiful feast and just me, no other doctors, unheard of. Um, and Salote, who's um, a very dear friend, um, tried to give a speech and she couldn't speak. <laughs> and I tried to reply and I couldn't speak. Um, it is one of the most amazing things I have done in my life and I would encourage you all to think about how you might step outside your box because these kind of experiences um, give, give much more um, than, you, than you know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Di, for that. That's um, really quite enlightening and moving. I might just um, let everyone know, we're being a bit flexible with time because we do have a couple of speakers that um, aren't coming to this session. Uh, they've had uh, things happen and haven't been able to attend. So our next speaker will be Olivia, and after that, Di is going to speak again for us at short notice. So um, we are, <laughs> so we, we're not gonna run hours and hours over. But that's why we are being a bit flexible. I would like to ask, does anyone have a question for Di that they'd like to ask? I might, I actually have something for you. So, um, quite moved by your presentation because I actually uh, did some work in that uh, that ICU before they moved into the new unit in Fiji, um, and some of those faces in those photos were very familiar to me. Um, uh, can you maybe talk a little bit around the challenges, potentially like the internal challenges of providing intensive? care and sometimes that includes treatments um, that may be futile in in a place that is so under resourced and where you really have to make some hard decisions about who gets what and why so the new ICU was 15 beds way too many um, so fortunately one of the good things that came out of Cyclone Winston was that um, they'd failed to listen to the engineers report and um, build a drain on the roof and so the water accumulated in the roof over the new ICU and the roof caved in. So one of the ICU pods was closed for a good six months and it just took time for it to be fixed because in fact the eight beds that we had was perfect. So what had happened was with the 15 beds um, the referrals were ridiculous. So we were getting referred 
people who had very little opportunity of um, getting better. So I spent a long time um, talking not only to the anaesthetists but to the physicians and the surgeons about the appropriate use of intensive care in their country and that they didn't want to end up where we are using a very valuable resource um, with ever in reducing um, uh, benefits and that it was very easy to to put someone in ICU and it was much harder to say no. And so we had all those very difficult difficult conversations and it really is, it's it's so stark there, the, um, the needs and the health dollar and how it gets spent and when you can't dialyse your chronic kidney disease population, you really need to think about who you're ventilating. And so, yeah, we had those difficult conversations and I would regularly go down with the team and they loved it when I went with them to ED and just went, no. Because the young ones, because of the hierarchical system in their culture, it's very difficult if a senior physician refers a patient for the junior registrar to say no. And so we start, you know, all of that conversation went on because, yeah, it is really important. Thank you very much.